Meanwhile, we kick off the parallel sessions. I will be your host for the rest of the afternoon in this room. Um, we will have the discussion on shared narratives, the cultural underpinnings of a region in this hall. Without any further delay, I will straight away call our guests on the stage. Ms. Meera Chand, novelist, uh, a novelist based in Singapore. Dr. Tamima Anam, a novelist based in Bangladesh. Professor Shirley Chu, a visiting professor at the NTU Singapore. Mr. Nuri Vitachi, a journalist and author based in Hong Kong. And Mr. Ramesh Gunasakura, author in the UK. I'll begin with introducing our panel chair, Ms. Meera Chand. She's the author of eight novels, two of which were set in India. In addition to her writing, Ms. Chand has been involved in many programs to promote literature and mentor young writers. There's a lot more to say about her, but I think since we're already a bit delayed, I will let our distinguished guests take on the stage. Thank you very much. I'd like to welcome you all to our session today. Um, this morning, uh, I don't know how many of you were in that first session when the DPM gave his speech, but he talked um, about the wealth that uh, was generated by the remittance of money sent back to the homeland from the diaspora, and the how in India particularly this had powered the growth of a middle class, building bridges between an outside world and the homeland. But I feel that in an intellectual remittance that's been generated by the writers and artists of all genres of the diaspora um, have contributed outstandingly to the cultural wealth of their home countries. We're living, as you all know, in a very transnational kind of moment in time in which an ever-growing global population have shared the experience of migration, relocation, cultural dis uh, dislocation in a post-colonial world. And the literature of any diaspora examines the migrants' experience, giving voice um, and the, sorry, it examines the migrants' experience and the effect that this has upon the individual, giving voice to experiences and insight into the dilemmas faced in the diasporic space. The writer of the diaspora examines lost roots, journeys made, places found in adopted countries, and the unique position at the crossroads of cultures that people of the diaspora have. And in a convention such as this, the sharing through discourse and dialogue of these issues is essential to understanding and interpreting how we negotiate and gain from our varied experiences within the diaspora. Now, as you all know, in the last decades, there has been an explosion of South Asian literature in the world. And the first migration of peoples has given rise to second and third generations who have been born far from their homelands and whose links with it are often very tenuous. And writers like those on our panel today, in which I include myself, we all write as multicultural mongrels. And in our modern times, where travel is easier and distance seems shorter, the word diaspora has lost much of its original connotation, its sad sense of exile, and morphed into something healthier that is actually a fascinating hybridism. How this crisis of identity is dealt with is perhaps the most interesting problem confronting writers of the South Asian diaspora today. And one thing that I personally have become very aware of over the years is how South Asian literature has moved from having a marginal place on the world stage 
to a central position. And it is the writers of the diaspora that have largely engineered this change. Often now, it is the diaspora that is writing the homeland, examining that home in a way that often goes beyond the usual discourse, and in doing so, speaking back to those in the motherland, expanding perceptions of values and roots, recasting the past anew. And as such, in our South Asian diaspora, literature has a place to me of very special importance for its investigation of our past and present experiences makes us aware of our common humanity. It allows us to know that we're not alone, but belong to a structured and growing community in the world with a common collective past and a dynamic and meaningful future. And while homelands create diasporas, diasporas also create homelands, homelands of the mind. So what is it that we're writing about as South Asians in the diaspora? Have we created a new genre of writing that is recognized as particularly South Asian? These issues and many more are what our distinguished panel will be discussing, I hope, today. So I'll introduce them to you now. I have on my right, uh, left here, Tamina Anam, who was born in Dhaka in Bangladesh, but grew up in Paris, New York, and Bangkok, and now lives in London. That's right, Tamina. <laughs> she has a PhD in social anthropology from Harvard University. Tamima's first novel, a Golden Age won the 2008 Commonwealth Writers' Prize for Best First Book, and her second, The Good Muslim, was shortlisted for the Man Asian Literary Prize. She was recently named one of Granta Magazine's Best of Young British Novelists. On my right, I have academic Shirley Chu, who's well known in Singapore and abroad. She was educated at the University of Singapore and Oxford University, and she's held academic posts both at the University of Singapore and the University of Leeds, where she's an emeritus professor, and for many years held the chair of Commonwealth and Postcolonial Studies. She is currently visiting professor at Nanyang Technological University here in Singapore. Shirley has published very widely and is also the founding editor of Moving Worlds, a journal of transcultural writings co-published from Leeds University and also NTU. At the end, I have my friend Nuri Bitachi, also known as Mr. Jam, Mr. Sam Jam. Uh, Nuri was born in Sri Lanka, but is based in Hong Kong, and I think had part of his growing up there as well. He's a prolific and widely published journalist and author of more than 20 books, including the comedy crime novel series, The Feng Shui Detective. Nuri also writes novels for children under the name Mr. Jam. Is that right, no, right. Nuri? It is. Yeah. Um, he has helped found the Asia Literary Review, the Hong Kong Literary Festival, and also the Man Asian Literary Prize. And at the other end, we have Ramesh Gunasekera. Uh, Ramesh was born in Colombo, but grew up in Sri Lanka and the Philippines before moving to London, where he now lives. His first novel, Reef, was shortlisted for the 1994 Booker Prize, as it was then. His second, The Sun, Sun, Sand Glass, received BBC's inaugural Asia Award, Award, and his third, Heaven's Edge, like his collection of stories, Monkfish Moon, was a New York Times notable book of the year. He runs acclaimed writing workshops around the world and has also been a judge for a number of prestigious literary awards. And he's currently writer in residence here in Singapore at Nanyang Technological University. Now, our common collective roots are sunk in similar cultural traditions, the shared narratives that we are here to discuss. And I know that you will have valuable and varied views um, on South Asian writing. 
And I'd like to invite you each to give the audience an insight into your views on, on diasporic writing. I think I'm going to ask you, Shirley, to go first, if you don't mind, because uh, we are all writers of fiction and journalism, but Shirley is an academic. She's a person that analyzes and dissects what we all do. So I think that Shirley's overview of, of South Asian writing will be very interesting and perhaps a little different from the other panelists. Okay. Some of the things I'm going to be saying um, overlaps with uh, Mira's uh, introduction. Anyway, given the overarching title of the, conf uh, of the conference, South Asian Diaspora, this paper constructs a shared narrative of the views of selected South Asian migrant writers on issues that inform and shape their writing. Let me begin by quoting Ebra Said on the two faces of diaspora. Quote, there is a great difference between the optimistic mobility, the intellectual liveliness, and the logic of daring described by the various theoreticians on whose work I have drawn, and the massive dislocations, waste, misery, and horrors endured in our centuries, migrations, and mutilated lives. Yet it is no exaggeration to say that liberation as an intellectual mission, born in the resistance and opposition to the confinements and ravages of imperialism, has now shifted from the settled, established, and domesticated dynamics, dynamics sorry, of culture to its unhoused, decentered, and exilic energies. Energies whose incarnation today is the migrant, and whose consciousness is that of the artist and intellectual in exile the political figure between domains, between forms, between homes, and between languages. Two points to note. First, Said's salutary reminder to us of the victims of enforced migrations that have become tragically so widespread a sign of our times. Only these last two months, the people who were drowned and shipwrecked in the waters between Indonesia and Australia. But to focus on South Asia, simply to venture into the literature of South Asia is to be made aware of the dislocations that have beset the subcontinent in the last 60 odd years. With partition, the Indo-Pakistan wars of 1965 and 1971, the Bangladeshi Liberation War, insurgency in Nepal, the internecine conflict in Sri Lanka, continuing border hostilities between India and Pakistan over Kashmir. And as is generally known, these predicaments that disfigure modernity have found their way into the works of many notable writers, Sadat Hassan Manto, Intisa Hussein, Kishwan Nahid, Kushwan Singh, Anita Desai, Shashi Despandi, Sunil Ganguly, Kalmula, Jean Arasanayagam, writers who have produced some of their best works around and after 1947. So in what way is the migrant artist and intellectual in exile, whom Said ardently sets before us in his writing, in what way is this person distinct? The answer lies in the manner in which he or she is conceptualized with the stress upon in-betweenness rather than the rooted space upon what lies away from rather than at the center and the possibilities all that holds for creativity. Culture and Imperialism was published in 1993 at a time when an important clutch of South Asian writers in diaspora were emerging or had emerged on this, uh, himself an exile, sorry, I begin again, himself an exile and migrant, someone out of place, as he tells us in his memoir. Said was especially attuned to the voices which became prominent in the 1980s and 1990s. Rushdie, Midnight's Children, 1980. Abita Ghosh, Babsi Sidwa, M.G. Vasanji, V.S. Naipaul, uh, writing 
Enigma of Arrival and Away in the World, brilliant novels. Michael Andache, Ramesh Ganesekara, whose collection of short stories appeared in 1992. This paper highlights some of the concerns they share in their writing, in particular, the ambivalent yet invigorating relationship the artist in diaspora has with homeland, identity, and language. Speaking of the sea passage from India to Trinidad, which was undertaken in mid 19th century by his ancestors, Naipaul sees the rupture as total and irrevocable when the past, I quote, suddenly broke off, suddenly fell away into the chasm between the Antilles and India. In contrast, there is Rushdie's careful mulling over the equivocal nature of freedom. I quote from a passage from Shame. To explain why we become attached to our birthplaces, we pretend that we are trees and speak of roots. Look under your feet. You will not find gnarled growth spreading through the soles. Roots, I sometimes think, are a conservative myth designed to keep us in our places. When individuals come unstuck from their native land, they are called migrants. When nations do the same thing, Bangladesh, the act is called secession. What is the best thing about migrant peoples and seceded nations? I think it is their hopefulness. And what is the worst thing? It is the emptiness of one's luggage. I'm speaking of the invisible suitcases, not the physical, perhaps cardboard variety containing a few meaning-drained mementos. We have come unstuck from more than land. We have floated upwards from history, from memory, from time. The problematic issue of migration is caught up in that doubleness of Rushdie's metaphors. Keep us in our places and come unstuck. One can choose to be safe, yet circumscribed in the one place. One can also come unstuck, even as one breaks free. On the one hand, the optimistic mobility. On the other, the attendant fear of disaster. So where is home? How does one write about a place left behind and perhaps not visited for many years? In a well-known essay, Rushdie notes that when the migrant writer looks back to the original home, Bombay in his case, I quote, our physical alienation almost inevitably means that we will not be capable of reclaiming precisely the thing that was lost, that we will, in short, create fictions, not actual cities or villages, but invisible ones, imaginary homelands, Indias of the mind. At the same time, fueled by the sense of loss, these homelands of the mind can paradoxically lead to richly significant work. The encompassing lyricism of A.K. Ramanujan's small-scale reflections of a great house, for example, or the powerful lament of Aga Shahid Ali's Lennox Hill, and the um, ludic and fantastical narrative of Rushdie's own Midnight Children. Untethered from the moorings of home and homeland, how then are we to know who we are? In a state of in-betweenness, how do we grapple with the puzzle of identity? Do we become strangers to ourselves, cut off from country, history, ancestral memory? Or do we, conscious of the shaping forces of time and place, learn to regard identity as plural and partial, a process of becoming as well as being? Listen to M.G. Vasanji in the following passage. He had moved from um, East Africa to Canada. I quote, I belong completely to Toronto when I'm there. I'm proud of its diversity and tolerance of difference. It has given me a haven to write from. It's not Paris or London, but it is the only place in which I can now live comfortably, knowing that I will be a minority anywhere in the world. And yet when I'm in India, some other part of me gets awakened and feels at home, at peace. I call it a spiritual home though not in a religious sense. And when I land in Dar es Salaam, I'm home in an entirely different way. I fall into Swahili. I walk easily into all neighborhoods. I may sit down on a bench on the sidewalk and have a demitasse of kahawa. 
and not worry about how the cup was washed. When I travel up country, which I prefer to do by bus, and get asked where I come from, I say simply, Dar es Salaam, Uhuru Street. Finally, one of the key concerns of the migrant artist is how to tell his or her story. Even Indias of the mind have, after all, to be recognizably India. How to recreate what absence has taken away, a lived experience of history, a sense of the texture of people's daily lives. What common ground can the migrant artist claim to have had, to have, sorry, with the readers of his, her work? Who does he, she write for? These are questions constantly asked by the writers themselves, by critics, by interested readers. We come closest to the answers when we acquaint ourselves with the substantive in contributions that writers in diaspora, Tamim Anam, Ramesh um, Vitachi, have made to South Asian literature today, to its diversity, its inventiveness, its capacity to speak to us of our time and of the damage and music of our world. I'll just end with two quotations because I'm running out of time and Mira will start twitching. So, on some of the gains of having uprooted themselves, here is a little quotation from Amitav Ghosh, River of Smoke. Had they, the Indians, not left the subcontinent, their paths would never have crossed, and few of them would ever have met or spoken with each other, far less thought of eating a meal together. At home, it would not have occurred to them to imagine that they might have much in common. But here, in Canton, whether they liked it or not, there was no escaping those commonalities. And finally, to end with uh, Rushdie, uh, in a comment that sums up some of the things I've been saying here. Sometimes we feel that we straddle two cultures, at other times that we fall between two stools. However ambiguous and shifting this ground may be, it is not an infertile territory for a writer to occupy. If literature is in part the business of finding new angles at which to enter reality, then once again our distance, our long geographical perspective may provide us with such angles. Or it may be that that is simply what we must think in order to do our work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shirley. Um, I'm going to keep to my right side, and I'm going to ask Ramesh if he will give us his views now. Okay. I'm I have to tell you, Ramesh, there's a lady at the back there who will be reminding us of time. Yes, I noticed yes. that. I thought that was a sign for applause, but <laughs> apparently not. That was time's up. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm very honored to be here. Um, I've often had to masquerade as as an Indian, actually, in m various conventions and so on, uh, and photographs in included. Uh, but today, this morning, I discovered the, uh, the idea of the PIO, persons of Indian origin, which means that we can all be PIO, presumably. Anthropologists can explain this to us, whether we all came from there or not. But what I'm really glad about is, for a long time, I've been looking for the diaspora and apparently, you're all here. Uh, and I'm very pleased to meet you. I want to find out a little bit about you. So can I just have a show of hands of people who are Bangladeshi here? Any Bangladeshis here? No, oh, okay. <laughs> How about Indians? Oh, we've got a few Indians, good. Pakistani? No. no oh, no, no, we have some, good. Sri Lankans? Oh, gosh, we almost outnumber the Indians. No, OK, excellent. <laughs> right, OK. Thank you very much. I, I thought I'll, um, I'll do something uh, given our topic. Uh, our topic is the cultural underpinnings of the region. And it seems to me that at this moment in time, particularly after last week, there are a couple of inevitable things to talk about, um, or at least one really, really important thing to talk about. Um, and that's not, you know, it's not the sort of comedy club thing about Chogum that happened last week. 
Uh, I'm thinking about Sachin Tendulkar, which I think probably would have uh, pulled together quite a lot of people. They say a billion plus were watching Sachin play his uh, 200th match. And I think that, in a sense, very seriously, actually, is the sort of thing that runs throughout more than just the region, but it actually runs through a lot of things. Um, and I thought that uh, even though he didn't make the century at the cricket match that he wanted to make, uh, his 200th match, um, I gave him a little gift myself years ago by uh, writing a little bit about him in one of my books. Um, so I gave him a little bit of minor immortality in a, in a very, very small book. So I couldn't really do better than uh, maybe to read you a little bit of that, just a couple of pages, because I think it also uh, not only shows something about that, something about identity, maybe what might or might not pull different people together or apart. Uh, it might also touch on some of the, the big elephants that are in the room, as it were. Um, but I'll just read you a, a couple of pages from a book called The Match, which is this one. And this is a couple of pages about a cricket match at the Oval in London, where Sri Lanka are playing India. Uh, this is a bit of a test because the light is going in the wrong direction, but never mind. I think I can just about see it. The atmosphere at the Oval was extraordinary. The noise level astounding. The stadium throbbed, ready to burst. Sri Lanka batted first. It wasn't a good start. Wickets fell fast, but the play was for runs, runs, runs. Anything cautious was booed. Sonny was in a stand mostly full of Indian supporters, with a small contingent of Sri Lankans two rows back. There were trumpets and drum rolls, klaxons and whistles and rattles and chants and screams. This was cricket at full decibel, a game where every ball was a missile and the field an arena of gladiators. Sonny realized he had known nothing about real cricket, nothing. These fans had come to watch, not to watch, but to participate. The players were not kings, but servants of the crowd. They existed only to please the crowd, do their bidding or be hauled off earn respect only with every ball. Glory from the past was not enough, except perhaps for the legendary Sachin Tendulkar, who raised a cheer every time he moved, even if it was only to slap a bit of elastic. By 11.30, the Sri Lankan captain was out, caught by Dravid to a huge row. Ooh, ah, India, was chanted again and again until 15 minutes later another wicket fell. Then a new, more menacing chant. Are you watching Pakistan? India had come from a roll, from a win over England the day before. Their fans were on a roll. They had Pakistan in their sights. Their commentator among the Sri Lankan family clicked his tongue and poured himself some wine. What has happened, he mourned. In 1996, we were the champions of the world. What the hell's gone wrong? What goes up must come down, no Machang. Even when you hit a six, his companion was a philosopher. So what? Then you hit another six. What's this looking down all the time? How will they ever do anything? Everybody in our country just blames everybody else. No wonder we always end up just fighting. An Indian chariot who'd never been to India nearby, was nearby. He was an Englishman. What's your name? Who do you support, he asked another Englishman nearby. India? He doubled up laughing. Of course, the Englishman said. My name is Hutton. The cheerleader turned to the crowd, astonished. Hey, Hutton is an Indian. Hutton is an Indian. The chant was taken up by everybody. Hutton is an Indian. Then somebody else ratcheted it up. Beckham is an Indian. Beckham is an Indian. <laughs> then Becker was an Indian. Becker was an Indian. A moment later, Hemman will be an Indian. <laughs> it was a new badge of honor. All heroes had to be Indian. Then another wicket fell. Eventually, the Indians came to bat. Tendulkar stepped forward. 
He smashed a hard, long drive. The ball, a round white bullet, shot across the grass towards a few fat pigeons congregated on an empty patch of ground. The birds were pecking at the earth and waddling about, ignoring the mad, momentous game around them, unaware of the tribal needs, the chameleon identities, the laws of science, and the art of hitting ducks. The ball sped into their midst and caused a flurry. The bird in the middle didn't stand a chance. The ball hit it. The pigeon heeled over. Play stopped. The whole of the oval was hushed. The nearest fielder walked over and picked up the bird as though it were a dove of peace. He carried it slowly towards the boundary. Sonny knew then that this was the photograph he had to take. He ran down to the rope faster than a long leg might streak to stop a boundary ball. He kept the lens of his camera small, knowing that in the photograph, the sky would be a bowl where newspaper confetti floated like circling buzzards, while in the center, a pair of clasped hands prayed to a dying bird. Its feathers trembled just enough to blur in and out of perfect focus, like life itself. He clicked the shutter before the groundsman's bucket swung into view to collect the corpse. There was something significant happening here. He knew, no matter what the outcome of the game would be, perhaps it was the power to silence that comes with death, however small the life, and our need to overcome it, to find some brief moment of care, hope, the tender possibility of renewal. This man this game, this bird, was salvation. The timing was perfect. Anything seemed possible. Peace, love, joy, life everlasting. It was all in the frame. Thank you. For that book. Wonderful, thank you, Ramesh, for that wonderful reading, really. I mean, that's a tremendous bonus for us to have, have a reading as well as discussion. Thank you. So thank you very much. I'm going to turn the other side now and ask Tamina sure. to uh, give us her views on our subject today. I'm gonna have to lower the mic significantly. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me back. I was lucky enough to be here the first year um, of the convention, and I'm pleased to see how much it's grown. Um, I hear that it's twice as big as it was last year. So if it, it keeps going at this rate, you'll have to rent out the whole island before you know it. Um, it's actually really apt that our session today should be called Shared Narratives. Um, because it really is through literature often um, that we come together um, into an idea of ourselves as individuals and as a collective. Um, our stories are what weave us together and give us a sense of belonging, whether the sense of belonging comes easily or as complicated as for many of us it is um, by dislocation. I joined the diaspora when I was only two years old. Uh, my father, uh, who was a young journalist, um, got a job with the United Nations, um, and although my parents had never really left Bangladesh, um, we moved to Paris. And this was the first of several moves around the world. Um, every few years, we would pack up our belongings, and my father would get posted to some other part of the world. Um, but no matter where we went, they always wanted to instill in me a sense of where I was from. And um, they did this in two ways. And I'm sorry to see there are no Bangladeshis in the audience. I'm Bengali, and um, in, in, in Bengali children it, across generations um, are sort of tortured by uh, Rabindranath Tagore. He's a kind of a, this godly figure, and I was similarly um, it, this was impressed upon me that that I uh, that this that he was a kind of centerpiece of of my of my sense of belonging and my sense of my roots. So you know, we would my father would drive me to school every morning um, to a French school, and he would make sure that I listened to um, Tagore songs on the way, and he would explain to me what they meant, and 
similarly on the way back, and, and we had this very old reel-to-reel -reel, uh, player, um, and in the afternoons and on weekends, we would also listen to Tagore songs, um, and I was encouraged to sing them, uh, not to great effect, unfortunately. Um, and, and the other way that, that I was given a sense of where I was from uh, was through the stories that my parents had about being revolutionaries in the Bangladesh War of Independence. Um, in their own ways, my parents both participated in the war, and my father was deployed um, by the kind of nascent uh, revolutionary movement uh, to travel throughout India to raise support um, for what was happening in Bangladesh throughout the nine months of the war. Um, so really, it was through stories, through narrative, that I was sort of encouraged to keep, keep this kind of thread of connection between myself and a place that I, as I grew older, um, got to know less and less. Um, so it really came as no surprise that I became a reader first and then also a writer. As a reader, South Asian uh, fiction has been hugely influential to me as it has been to anyone who writes about and around that region. Um, I remember the first time I picked up um, Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children, which is an iconic book for many people of my generation, um, and I realized that I could write or I could read a novel that was populated by people like me, um, and that was a great uh, sense of permission, really, um, and a, a sense of, of, of the world being suddenly expanded and the possibilities of writing suddenly being expanded. Um, as a novelist, however, I both resist and enjoy the category of being South Asian. Um, I enjoy it because I find in my fellow writers from the region a great sense of camaraderie, um, of meeting kindred spirits. Um, I was just at a literary festival um, with Romesh um, in Dhaka, which I co-organize. Uh, um, and one of the, the goals of this festival is to bring South Asian writers together. And of course, there are writers from other parts of the world, but it's always um, very surprised, people who come, especially from Pakistan, who come to Bangladesh um, for this festival are always really astonished because the ideas that they have about a country that used to be belong to them or, or to be, to, to, that our two countries were really one country only 42 years ago um, appears to be so radically different from the Pakistan that they know today. Um, so really, um, in that sense, being a South Asian writer and being categorized as a South Asian writer um, is very meaningful and very fruitful. Um, but every category exists for us to challenge and kind of expand its borders and limitations. Um, I use the category of South Asian and any assumptions it contains in order to challenge expectations um, that are cast upon me by my nationality or regional identity or gender. Um, in this challenging of categories, fiction is especially useful because fiction is the celebration of the particular. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that novels are about specificity. They take ideas and put them into the bodies of people. When you write characters, you have the opportunity to affect a reader's previously held notions about how that character might behave, how they might speak, or the ideas they might have. Reading is a transformative experience that fundamentally alters the way we see the world because it, because it is still the only medium, despite all the technological advancements we've had um, in the arts, it's still the only medium through which we are actually given the privilege of living in someone else's mind, of imagining their thoughts, of getting a sense of what their hopes and fears might be, even if just for a moment. So this kind of experience of empathy is deeply transformative. And in this sense, writing fiction is a radical and revolutionary act. And reading is a similarly kind of upsetting and dislocating experience. Um, it tells us what we share, but also importantly, what we don't share. And in this kind of talk about shared narratives, it's also important for us to, to talk about particularity, to talk about the things that set us apart from one another. Even as we have a history or language or shared intellectual history or, or things that we share like cricket, in fact, um, so, in my next novel, I decided to write about a migrant worker. And I'm a migrant writer, so I thought maybe I could write about a migrant worker. Um, and it's interesting that this morning we were talking about remittance. And remittance is often talked about in these very kind of, um, 
you know, these economic terms. Um, in Bangladesh, remittance is a very important engine of our economy, um, along with uh, the ready-made garments industry. It's the, these are the twin engines of our economy. And on the one hand, um, it's these very young men who are sent abroad um, to, to send money back home, and it's these young in these factories. And this is really what, what, what holds our economy together and, has, and propels it forward. Um, but actually, what I wanted to write about um, what, what I hope I'm able to write about is not about this person, this migrant worker, as an engine of our economy, but about the loneliness and hardship and alienation he experiences. Um, so the kind of idea being that when you read the story, you don't think of remittance just as um, cash flowing from one place to another, but really the kind of the, the human that is behind that cash, the human that is behind that engine of change, and the suffering that he experiences, even though there's a kind of hopefulness there, even though there's a kind of transformative possibility there. Um, and really, that's what fiction can do. Um, so I, 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 I want to celebrate that, to celebrate the particular, and to, and to really emphasize what that kind of possibility is, and, and that fiction is, is one of the mediums, and one of the only mediums in which we can still do in which we can do that. So I'm, I'm really proud to be a novelist and, and invite you all, um, this is a uh, library board event, I believe, um, to, to kind of keep that in mind when you think about um, all of these larger issues that we're discussing about our collective um, aspirations for the region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tamima. That was fascinating. Nuri, please. Thank you. Louder! <laughs> Hello. Can you hear me? You can. Good. Should I do the whole speech like this? Hey, did you notice something? As soon as our beautiful MC said the word culture, all the men left. Do you notice that? It's like wall to wall, guys. And then suddenly, and it wasn't as if the previous session was like gripping. And the previous session, I mean, it's very, I'm sure it's very important, but it was, it was like two guys signing their names, watched by two other guys. Not exactly Cirque du Soleil, is it? And then as soon as the next session will be on culture, all the guys in black suits <laughs> out the door. And that, let's do a survey. Um, hands up if you are female. Okay, hands up if you are male. Hands up if you're not sure. Okay, mostly female, for sure. Well, um, <clears throat> let me start by saying that what an honor it is to be here on this stage are the finest brain cells in the Asian literary scene. But that's enough about me. Um, <laughs> no, it's great to be here with these guys and such an important subject too. Um, but I'm going to approach it a little bit differently. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I was a very dreamy child. I can remember um, the a teacher doing a careers lesson, and she asked each member of the class, what would you like to be when you grow up? When she got to me, what would you like to be when you grow up? And I said, a tree. She explained that I could not be a tree, but uh, in a week she would ask me again, and I'd have to choose something human. So I thought long and hard, and uh, I'd read a book about a guy called King Arthur, who had a very large weapon. And uh, I thought that would be cool. So the next week I said, King Arthur. And she thought I said, an author. She told my parents, he wants to be an author. And my parents told my high school, and lo and behold, I'm an author now. This is a lesson to all of us. Speak clearly. It may spoil your whole life. Now, when I was a kid, I could speak Tamil and Sinhala and English all muddled up together. But my father told me, you must learn English, because English would make me part of the great global shared narrative, which was important. And so I learned English. 
Now, my English language textbook said that every English speaker starts a conversation by saying, how do you do? And the correct reply is, fine, thank you. How do you do? And I practiced that for long hours, and eventually I got to go to London. And I tried it in London uh, with my Sri Lankan accent. How do you do? And they said, how do we do what? Because that's not the correct greeting in UK at all. You know, anybody have been to London? Any Londoners? Yeah, quite a few. The correct greeting in London is, watcha, mate. And, uh, or if they really like you, watcha, puke face. You know, um, I eventually asked somebody, what does it mean, this watcha? And nobody knew what it meant, which interested me, because they said it 20 times a day. Um, later, I went to stay with my brother, who lives in New York, and I tried it there. Hello, hello. How do you do? And um, you know what the correct greeting in New York is, don't you? Yo. I asked them, what does yo mean? <laughs> and nobody knew, which uh, uh, surprised me as well. Eventually, I uh, moved to this part of the world, and uh, I read my Chinese book. And my Chinese book says, all Chinese people start conversations by saying, ni hao. And then you have to uh, reply, uh, or, or lei hao if you're Cantonese, then you have to reply, ni hao, lei la. And uh, anyway, they don't. They start off with saying, wait, di ma. I asked one of my Chinese friends, what does that mean? And he said, it means yo. <laughs> what does this all mean? It means that we think we all are part of the same thing because of our language, but in fact, we're not. We're all very different, and, uh, and the language often uh, is a danger area where we meet, which is why literature is important. Um, and I eventually, uh, uh, as I said, I became an author, and uh, I was doing some editing for uh, somebody's book, and there was this sentence in it. It was a Chinese writer's book, and the sentence was this. <clears throat> she got through one catty of vegetables and five bowls of congee. Okay, now this was a Chinese writer had written this, and I was uh, helping to edit the English version. Now the English editor objected to this sentence. The English editor said, you can't put Chinese words in it, you have to change it. You have to put one pound of vegetables and five bowls of, of gruel, or something like that. <laughs> so I went back to the Chinese writer, and the Chinese writer was baffled. The Chinese writer said, Kati and kanji are not Chinese words, they're English words. In Chinese you would say, one can of vegetables and five bowls of juk. Now, I know enough Chinese and I know enough English to realize that both of them thought they were speaking the truth. In fact, in Chinese that sentence would be, one can of vegetables and five bowls of juk. In English, uh, it would be one pound of vegetables and five bowls of gruel. So what language is kati? What language is kanji? I started to make a list of words that Chinese people thought were English and English people thought were Chinese. The list grew fast. I went into a car park in Hong Kong and there was a big sign saying shroff. And my Chinese friend said, that's English for car park cashier. And my English friend says, that's Chinese for car park cashier. Uh, I started, this list grew faster and faster. I went to Shanghai. The Bund is the riverbank in Shanghai. And Chinese people thought it was English. English people thought it was Chinese. Now, you've probably guessed by now that all these in-between words are actually from South Asia. They're Indian, Tamil, uh, Malay, and they're all over the place. Uh, I can give you uh, other examples. In Malaysia or Singapore, gold is counted by the tail, T-A-E-L. And Chinese people think it's English, English people think it's Chinese. It is neither. Uh, pagoda is another one. English people think pagoda, that's the Chinese word for those tall towery things. But Chinese people think pagoda, that's the English word 
for the tall towers. It's not English or Chinese. Uh, Mandarin, I'm staying in the Mandarin uh, Marina Hotel. Okay, Chinese people think it's an English word. English people think it's a Chinese word. All these words are South Asian. And I bring this up because South Asians are actually the invisible glue between East and West. You don't know we're here. We're quiet. We sneak around. We're very sneaky and slinky. But we're there, and we actually make it all happen. Um, in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in Malaysia, uh, we were the ones who were in between the Chinese and the Western uh, groups. Uh, we were compradors. We were uh, export, import people. We were making it all happen. And that's why the Indian, uh, the South Asian diaspora is important, because we're so quiet. Um, in Hong Kong, they created a, a, a museum of Hong Kong history, and there was not one reference to the Indian community. Uh, I looked up some ancient documents of Hong Kong, and I was interested to see that the first inhabitants were a group called the Hakka, uh, Chinese boat people. S then came the Scottish, not the British, the Scottish. Then came the Indians. Then came the Cantonese. So in fact, are Indians visitors in the Cantonese society, or are the Cantonese visitors in a Scottish Indian society? Now, if I said this in Hong Kong, I'd be in terrible trouble, which is why I'm saying it here instead. Um, but, uh, to, but just to leave you with my, my, my message is that um, the South Asian diaspora is not high profile. It's very quiet, but it's very important. And it's in literature and culture that it sneaks out. Thank you. Nuri, thank you very much for that. Um, we're doing quite well for time, and I would like now to open our discussion to the floor and ask if you have any questions you would like to put to our panel. We're having great difficulty up here, I should tell you, by a complete, oh, that's much better. Mm -hmm. Now I can, we can actually see you. And if you ask a question, we can even know where to point to say, yes, please ask. So please, do, do uh, ask us some questions. Is there anyone who would like to start off? They're really shy. Robin, over there, yes. Well, you did say everyone is very quiet, didn't you, Louis? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's right. Uh, my name's Robin Jeffrey. I work at ISAS. Uh, could the panel d talk a little bit about the initial difficulties uh, or obstacles or indeed the smooth path they might have had at publishing globally when they first began to write, that is getting in with the UK and the American publishing uh, uh, firms, the kinds of uh, barriers they may have had to overcome or indeed if they had a smooth passage that would be interesting as well to me and a few like people like me. Who would like to start off with that? Ramesh? Well, just because I'm the oldest here, I guess. <laughs> um, publishing, I think, there's lots of misconceptions about it because I, I think publishing has always been difficult for most writers, whatever their background is. Um, but I guess if you look back in time, uh, if you go back even 30 years, um, there was certain difficulties in terms of perception, I guess. When I started writing, I certainly do remember uh, publishers, agents, uh, talking in terms of how little interest there would be in, uh, in the UK market, if you like, in terms of people who buy books, about books set in other parts of the world. I remember being told quite clearly that uh, uh, when I was writing my first book that no one would really be interested in a story, set of stories set in Sri Lanka. Uh, they would certainly not be... In, it, but more importantly, they would, be not, they would not be interested in short stories. But then also equally importantly, he said, well, even if you did get published, no one would be able to find your book because they can't pronounce your name, <laughs> which is fair enough. But actually, cricket has changed that. You know, amazing numbers of people in British broadcasting are extremely good at 
pronouncing Sri Lankan names now. Um, but things have, you know, things have changed enormously in some respects. Um, again, if you go back 40 years, I had a friend of mine who was an African writer who found that all his novels tended to end up on the anthropology shelves of bookshops, <laughs> not in the fiction. So that's all changed because now, of course, a lot of, if you like, indigenous English writers would quite like to get onto the South Asian shelf in a, in a, in a major bookshop in London. So that has changed. But uh, publishing is, is, not, is not an easy thing to break into. And um, I guess it's changed now. For me, it was personally, I guess, it was difficult not, be not because of really a to do with Asianness or something. It was the main difficulty is I wanted, to, I wanted to write stories and get published. It's just that I wasn't writing any. You know, so for a long time, there wasn't anything. Uh, it was only a desire. Uh, and by the time I got around to putting desire into action, and I actually had some books, I, it proved remarkably easy, in a sense. Um, but I think it's changed a lot. I mean, you know, in, to me, must just been on this list, the grant list of the best of uh, young British novelists. And that list is, is really interesting for the range of people's backgrounds on that list. And these are people who are, you know, writing in English, regarded as British writers, because these nationality boundaries don't really matter a great deal anymore. Mima, would you like to say a word? I, I just that? want to say one thing which has really changed in the last 20 years, is that um, the center of publishing is no longer just in the US and in the UK. Um, there's a really thriving publishing industry in India. Um, and so now, um, you know, we can write, uh, read, publish, and consume our own books. Um, it's, it, so the kind of looking only to one part of the world to get published in order to be known globally has really changed, and, and literary prizes are now located in different places. Um, and I think it really makes a difference in the kinds of books that come out. For instance, now in South Asia, a lot of regional writing, a lot of writing in translation is starting to come out. Um, so even though the medium is still English, even though we still look to English as a language that we all want to read and write in, um, it doesn't always have to be the language that, that the, a piece of fiction originates in. Um, so I think that's one of the major differences. That, that Nuri, kind of what about you? Yeah, you know, uh, I think being Asian can be a huge advantage, but I have some really bad news for you. You have to be Asian and female. Uh, you know, I had a, I had a friend who, uh, do you remember Arundhati Roy in, in 1996? She, uh, there was a big auction for her book, The God of Small Things. Uh, well, a friend of mine, who, who'd, who better be nameless, um, she, she found out the list of all the publishers who had been in that auction but failed to win. And she wrote to all of them and said, I'm also a writer and I wear a sari. And they all replied, we're interested. OK, that's all she had to do. Uh, and, um, and she got her book published uh, by a big Western publisher. OK, so, um, so I think being from a minority can be an advantage because um, uh, let's face it, there are too many authors out there writing geo geopolitical thrillers set in the US. There are too many crime stories in, in the UK and Scandinavia. You know, we have crime here in Asia, don't we? We're very proud of it, you know? Uh, so, um, the, the, so, as uh, Tamina said, it, things are really, things are, are changing and, you know, Asia is rising. But, what shocks me a bit is people don't realize what's going on here. Like you said about the, the Indian book industry, it's really thriving. And um, you know, um, the best-selling book in 2003 in Japan was a book called Deep Love, and it was written and transmitted on mobile phones. Yeah. That was easily the best-selling book. Uh, the best-selling book in China in 2006 was The Ghost Blows Out the Candle. It was chapter by chapter entirely on PCs. Okay, this is before the Kindle had even appeared in the West. There's massive publishing going on in Asia that nobody knows about. Um, there's um, uh, uh, the, I mean, it's kind of two worlds, I think. I think it's very, much, it's very worth getting a Western publisher 
um, I think it does, it changes your status uh, a lot. Can I just add something yeah. to, to both of that actually, actually? Yes, I mean, I think the, the way publishing happens in different parts of the world is enormously different now. Uh, I think actually, you know, Korean books are really the biggest, biggest thing on the planet at the moment because of, because of the fact that they're read on screens, because of Korean culture, because of Korean music, which is all to do with Samsung screens, actually. That's where it all comes from. But in terms of Indian publishing, you know, Tamim is right. It's a, it's a, it's a really, really important thing. Yeah. But in terms of this, actually, this, the rest of this conference, anyway, where there are lots of business people around talking about trade and so on, there are some really, really important underpinning things that work against it. So that if you're outside India, if you're in Sri Lanka or Bangladesh or uh, Pakistan, actually still books from the UK or the US are cheaper to get and are faster to get than from India. Uh, I think somebody, well, one, of the, one of the very important people this morning was saying how quickly people can move around. But actually people can't move around that quickly. From Dhaka, um, coming to Singapore was easy. From Singapore, I can get back to London faster than someone can get back from Dhaka to Madras um, or to, to Mumbai. Um, and it's the same with books. Uh, booksellers in Sri Lanka complained to me saying, you know, everyone's now getting published in India. We can't get the books. They're too expensive. Uh, there's too much tax. There's too much this. There's too much that. And it's, it's really, really strange. Shirley, you're um, looking at all this from a slightly different viewpoint from us. You're the editor also of a, a, a literary magazine. Um, do you have any sense of things changing in, in what you are publishing or the kind of... Um, uh, well, two things. Uh, circulation first, or whatever. First is that I'm an independent publisher. Um, we publish... Uh, well, I, I'm the editor of Moving Worlds, and um, it comes out twice a year. Mm. And it's uh, on display uh, 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 at one of the desks out there. Um, but what I am aware of at the moment is that, certainly in the UK, there are a lot of small publishers. Yes, I was also going to And say they're how. willing to mm. risk, mm. Uh, you know, either uh, well, being there for a few years and uh, hopefully carrying on or very often they collapse. But uh, these little publishers sometimes do very good things. I think uh, the uh, Man Asian Booker winner, uh, Tan Tuan Eng, I mean, he, his brilliant book, uh, Evening, uh, of, yeah. uh, uh, of Evening Miss, um, um, that uh, was published uh, not by a, not by Bloomsbury or one of these uh, notable publishers. In fact, when, it, when he won the prize, uh, it was remarked that, you know, it's been brought out in this rather, well, uh, penny-pinching sort of format, a uh, tiny sort of uh, 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 paperback. So places like People Tree, Cinnamon Press, mm. um, in, um, and places in Manchester, um, they are very encouraging to um, young and up-and-coming writers. So, I mean, that's my impression. Yes, I, well, I've, I also notice how many small um, individual publishers mm. there are now in Britain today. Mm. There's been so many huge takeovers yes. that, you know, that, that, that's, it's, yes. it's changed mm. the publishing mm. world completely. Mm. When I pu published my first novel, and Ramesh says he's the oldest here, but I, I'm afraid I have to say I think I am, because when I first published, it was still the age of the gentleman publisher. And uh, I, I wrote my first novel in Japan and sent it off to a publisher in London, John Murray. And I chose John Murray because they published Ruth Jugvala. And I thought, well, if they published her, they were interested in books that were not Eurocentric necessarily, as Ramesh said. Mm -hmm. And um, my publisher was then John Murray, Jock Murray, he was John Murray the Eighth in a long line of a dynasty. <laughs> and his son, John Murray the Ninth, took over, <laughs> but he was the last John Murray. Um, 
and that, that age is gone, it's gone. So can we have another question? Yes, Anne. And there's a mic for you. The farther away you get from South Asia, the more the Indians and Pakistanis and Sri Lankans and Bangladeshis, the more they see they really have in common. Um, and so the diaspora uh, sort of has that insight um, more so than I think a lot of the people back home do. And I wondered whether you think that's true, and if so, whether you think you're able to convey that to the people back home, in a way, or what used to be your home, whether that sense that we are really all brothers and sisters in South Asia, whether that is uh, increasing or declining. Would like to go first on that. Tamima, what about you? Um, I think the one thing we haven't talked about is religion. And in fact, that tends to be both something that unites people and also divides them. So for instance, um, in Bangladesh, um, you know, it's a predominantly Muslim country, um, and people are religious uh, to a certain extent. Um, but you notice a lot of diasporic communities um, have a kind of memory of the kind of uh, way that people practice their faith back home that doesn't actually exist anymore. Um, so in London, uh, the Bangladeshi community is often very devout, and their supporters, a lot of them, and I'm, not gen I'm generalizing here, so it's not everybody, um, but they support uh, some of the Islamic parties. Um, and the Islamic parties in Bangladesh don't have a lot of popular support. Um, so in fact, going outside of your country and it, living in a diasporic community and relating to your home um, through a nexus of like your memories and the challenges that you have in this new home, so trying to set yourself apart in the new place, I think actually really alters your perception of what's going, what's going on back in that place, um, if that makes any sense. So I, I do think that there, there can be a sense uh, of a regional identity among diasporic communities, but often that identity um, also fixates around religion. Um, so you find Bangladeshis and Pakistanis um, perhaps closer in diasporic communities than they are back in Bangladesh and Pakistan. Um, I, I don't know if this resonates with others, um, but I do think that religion more and more um, is playing a large part in the ways in which communities come together outside of their homes. Nuri, do you have any thoughts yeah. on uh, that? I really agree with what you say. Away from South Asia, we all become one, all the wars disappear. Um, I can give you an example. When I was a kid, um, we, we moved to London uh, because of the, the war in Sri Lanka. And my mother, just, she just treated it as a London, as, a, as the local village. She just said, OK, there's the local school. You'll go there. And she signed me up for this school without doing any study on it. Anyway, it was an experimental school for juvenile delinquents. <laughs> so I turn up, this little timid Asian boy. And you know my class is 29 neo-Nazis. Um, and uh, I can remember, uh, I remember being cornered by a group of them um, uh, who announced they were going to beat me to a pulp. And, uh, and I said, why? And they said, because you're Pakistani. We are Paki bashers, they said. So, uh, you know, like a typical, typical South Asian, you know, I said, well, you know, um, if you look at the atlas, you'll find that Sri Lanka is a completely separate country from Pakistan. It's, uh, in fact, many hundreds, perhaps a thousand miles away. You know, uh, and they just beat me up anyway. Um, from then on, I just never argued. If they, if they said, you, Paki, or, or Indian kid, you know, I just said, yes. You know, <laughs> because uh, it's as you say, we all, become, we all become one. All those wars are, are forgotten. And then, and then when we get back to Sri Lanka, of course, you Tamil, you know, we, we, we fight each other. So distance helps, I think. Ramesh, any Ramesh? thoughts, sir? I think I'm not uh, slightly differently. I think I'm not sure we do all become uh, South Asians outside. Uh, I don't know. I think there are other things that set people 
people apart. Um, and I don't know if there are any Sri Lankans in the audience. You probably know that anywhere in the world you go, if you're bound to find a Sri Lankan because they're all over the place. And uh, they will immediately uh, make contact mm. and, and be friends and want to know which school you went to. And particularly, they're very, very interested in your surname because that tells a mm. whole story. Uh, so I, I think that identity actually survives. But, uh, but I, to me, I, I don't know. It, it really is just one of the things that make our people. And, and there are two things that strike me, actually. One is that, to me, a far more important distinction in the world is between people who read novels and people who don't read novels. <laughs> and frankly, the ones who read novels are a minority in the world, and you can spot them. You know, they have that look. Uh, and that's, it's great. I love that look. I seek them out all the time. Uh, and given a choice between talking to a South Asian and talking to a reader, you know where I'll go. Uh, but the other aspect is, is I think these identities are so, so, so fluid and so uh, temporary. Um, this book that I read from The Match, uh, which I was reading the cricket stuff, a lot of that takes place in the Philippines uh, and the Philippines of the 1960s. Uh, now, I happen to live in the, in the Philippines in the 1960s. I, I grew up there, so I, I, I know it and I remember it. But of course, most Filipinos, being young, because that's the demographic of the population, don't know the 1960s Philippines. It's a totally foreign country. And of course, 1960s Philippines was, was very, very different, you know. It was the Hollywood of Asia. Um, and so it is such a separate experience. And uh, when I did publish that book, I did go back to the Philippines. And it was really interesting talking to Filipinos about it. Um, and I noticed there were lots of discussions about it as to, you know, if someone writes a book like this about our place, as it were, who are we? And, you know, I remember seeing a headline somewhere where it said, you know, do you have, you know, this is this book, do you have to be a Filipino to be a Filipino? No, not really. You just have to share some time and space with, with certain people. Um, and I, love, I, I like that idea. I like a very open kind of uh, definition. And there was a wonderful moment in Ireland, which I think has passed. But there was a wonderful moment when I think the, uh, the leader, I can't remember uh, who it was, who was being questioned about nationality and so on. And there was a big question about who is Irish. Uh, and she said, basically, anyone who wants to be. You know, if you say you're Irish, good enough. If you're a writer, even better. You know, and I, I quite like that openness. Oh, that's, that's very nice. Yeah. Shirley, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, actually, if I may throw the cat among the pigeons, uh, South Asia is a makeup term. And uh, it tends to conceal difference, which I think is important. So, as an academic, I, I, have, I use the term. Uh, it's like third world, which people detest now. So, and I had a postgraduate who, was a, who is a Sri Lankan, and she hated uh, the uh, category, the label, uh, South Asian, because it meant that uh, somehow, for her, Sri, Lankan, uh, Sri Lanka became sort of uh, subsumed uh, 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 into the larger subcontinent. So there's that. At the same time, think of South Asian literature. Of course, it's there in titles of books. If you go out there, you'll see a lot of them. But uh, to quote, uh, uh, to paraphrase Auden, uh, if poetry makes nothing happen, I do not know if South Asian literature is going to be a kind of peacemaker or be responsible for kind of harmony. Except that, of course, as Rushdie says, literature, and this is why it is important, I agree with you, to be reading uh, novels or reading poetry, it gives you an angle into reality. When Moving Worlds publish a piece of um, a play, part of a play, by Harish Sharma, it was uh, to do with how his grandfather had migrated to Japan during the years of partition. And the late Minakshi Mukherjee, whom uh, I loved uh, dearly, said when she read it, 
I didn't know that. In India, we just think of Pakistan, India. We hadn't thought of the ones who went away somewhere else. And so that was interesting to me. I was also asking uh, when I met some, uh, a number of Pakistan uh, native people, uh, people from Lahore, Salima Hashmi, when they saw in uh, Indians in England, they met and they fell into each other's arms. So I said, playing the devil's advocate, aren't you supposed to be enemies? You're not supposed to be speaking to each other and loving each other. They said, surely we're Punjabis first and Indians or Pakistanis second. So there is that kind of, uh, you know, way of so being uh, uh, friendly and um, uh, meeting place uh, link, uh, uh, um, in the thing. But I don't know if literature, South Asian literature, so-called, is going to make a very great impact. I think we have time for one, one more question. Yeah. Uh, I have a very inconsequential question for uh, Ramesh. Uh, you know, the incident about you know the the, the ball <laughs> hitting the you know, the bird was that a true Tendulkar event or you know, because there was uh, uh, an early incident? <laughs> this is this is the problem with fiction. You see, people always <laughs> want it to be true, don't they? Yeah. But that's the lovely thing about fiction is you don't really know. You can play with it, but. Uh, but actually, yes, it did happen. And uh, uh, I mean, it, to me, it, it was quite a nice aspect of the uh, interface or the, the rubbing up of fiction and reality. Because um, you know, we all love that connection with, with, where, we, where our favorite imaginary characters become more real than the pe people who are sitting next to us, which is why we go to places where imaginary novels have been set and we want to follow certain things. That's why if you're of a very young, a younger generation, you, you go to King's Cross in London because Harry Potter goes off to Hogwarts from platform 19, whatever it is, and now you can go to that platform because they built one to make it real. Um, the same way you follow, you know, Leopold Bloom around, Ireland, uh, around Dublin and all these things. But in this case, um, yes, it did happen. Um, and there is a photograph of this bird, which I hadn't seen, but uh, after that book was published in one of the reviews that were done by the TLS, they managed to find this photograph uh, of someone carrying off this bird, and it was as though my character in my book had taken the photograph. So the reality and the, and the fiction came up very nicely on a page. Well, much as I would like for us to go on, and I'm sure there are many more interesting questions we could ask you. I'm afraid our time is up, so I thank uh, Ramesh Gunaswakera and Shirley Chu and Tamina Nam and Nuri Vitachi for being with us today, and thank you all for coming and listening to us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, I guess.